Good morning. On this beautiful first Sunday of Advent, we kick off our theme, No Peace on Earth. Get it? You guys get that? Hmm? No, yes, there is peace on earth in Jesus. And I pray that this Advent season, you find that peace that is for us today in Christ who died and rose, who is coming again. And one way to do that uh, during our crazy times is being right here, taking communion, being his word, gathering together. Uh, Another way is daily being in his word. We have a daily devotion that is out. Sign up. It's in here. Uh, The pastor Keating and myself are writing each day. Easy, right? You get an email in, read a little scripture, and boom, you just did your devotion. So I challenge you to take a look at that. Make that your daily devotion. And uh, we have Wednesday services as well. Beautiful, calm Wednesday, Wednesday services, meal beforehand with harp. Uh, and bells and uh, maybe bells. I'm um, pretty excited about that. And wonderful singing. And we're going to be talking about the angels of Advent. And we've got this cool Advent wreath new here, uh, right here, and uh, new Advent candles. So it's kind of sad because it's been a lot of fun t- in the years past to watch the candle blow um, wax all over the uh, all over the carpet. It's really quite amazing, if not miraculous, how it always did that. So we tried to stop that. So I, I'm sorry to disappoint you, by the way, for those of you that were looking forward to seeing wax all flying everywhere and uh, having these weird candle creations. But we went to oil here. So let's see. Let's see what happens uh, this Advent. So, uh, but uh, watch our Advent wreath. Uh, the green represents life eternal in Christ. The evergreen, the circle, the same. The candles, the light of Christ. Uh, and uh, we light one as we get closer to Christmas. And on Christmas we light the Paschal candle, the presence of Jesus who is with us today. So we thank God for this uh, new wreath. May God bless us through its use Let us have a little time of silence and prayer before we begin with a baptism that we have here of David. Let's pray and get ready to sing. who had a health uh, deal here. She's recovered here. Uh, One of our teachers 
at uh, the school there, and it is such a pleasure uh, to be a part of this. But we are hoping to see your mom. I know she's running in late, right? Yeah, she's just finding parking. She's finding parking right now. Okay, what we're, <laughs> what, yeah, that's, uh, she's not alone. <laughs> that. Let's do this. Let's begin uh, this, these words here, and hopefully she will come up and we'll wait off that baptism till she gets here, because I know we'd like her to ha- be a part of this, right? So we will start uh, right now. Um, we've all been we've all been there before. Uh, turn to page two sixty eight in the front part of your hymnal. Page two sixty eight. I can't tell you what an honor, privilege, and joy I have of baptizing this guy here today. So uh, thank you, David, for being a part of for being a part of this. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the Apostle Peter has written, baptism now saves you. So that's why we're doing it. The Word of God also teaches us that we've all, we're all con, uh, conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We'd be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent his Son, Jesus, who atoned for the sins of the whole world, and whoever, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. David, what's your full name? David Duran, receive the sign of the Holy Cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, in your strict judgment you condemn the unbelieving world through the flood, yet according to your great mercy you preserve believing Noah and his family, eight souls in all. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and all his hosts in the Red Sea, yet led your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of your holy baptism. Through the baptism of the Jordan of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus, you sanctified and instituted all waters to be a blessed flood and a lavish washing away of sin. We pray that you would behold David according to your boundless mercy. Bless him with true faith by the Holy Spirit, that through this saving flood all sin in him, which has been inherited from Adam, which he himself has committed since, would be drowned and die. Grant that he be kept safe and secure in the holy ark of the Christian church, loved by us here at St. James. Bless his whole life in Christ and keep him in the hope and peace of Jesus, serving you at all times, that he will be declared worthy of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we all say, Amen. Now let's pray the prayer Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord preserve you coming in and you're going out from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Uh, together, you may be seated here, and uh, together uh, we are going to confess the faith along with David, the faith in which he's being baptized. And for those at the door, be looking for Shannon, please, so we can get her up here. Uh, she should be coming in any second here now. Together, let's, let's uh, respond to this. David, do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I do. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I do. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Yes, I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Yes, I do. Amen. Do you desire to be baptized? Yes. 
All right, we're going to do this. We are waiting for his mom to come in here, and we're going to light the Advent wreath right now. How's that sound? Let's sing our O Come, O Come, Emmanuel right now, and hopefully that will work there. Let's go to page six there, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and we'll light our wreath. Is our lighter, where's our lighter at? Come on up here, Shannon. How awesome is that, right? We waited for you. We didn't wait, actually. We got going here. but uh, Awesome. This is uh, David's mom here, Shannon. Good to have you here. Ready for the baptism? Let's do it. Okay, come on over here. There you go. That's good, actually. Why don't you stand down there? Yeah. Get your head over here. David, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Round of applause for David. The Lord be with you. Watch over here. Here. Pastor, if you could be a towel, bigger towel, use that for right now there. The Lord be with you, David, and we thank God that we get to be a part of this moment in your life. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water in the Spirit, has forgiven you of all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. And to receive this burning light here. Um, I'll take that if you want to get that. And this light, there you go, remind, uh, centers us and focuses on us, focuses us on the light of Christ. Be ev ever watchful for his coming, that you too with all of us may gather together on the day that he comes again in glory. Also, as a, uh, <laughs> as a baptized person in holy baptism, the Father has made you a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with all of us. You are our brother in Christ, and we receive you in the name of Jesus, equal to any of us. You are a child of God. 
And may we care and love one another as well as David, as the body of Christ, as Jesus commands us to do. And in Christ, together we hear his word, receive his gifts, and proclaim the praise of him who called us out of darkness and into his uh, marvelous light. So together, let's say, Amen. We welcome you in the name of the Lord. Let us rise and pray. Almighty and most merciful God and Father, we praise and we thank you for this day that you have graciously preserved and enlarged your family. You have granted David the new birth in holy baptisms. You've made him a member of your son, our Lord Jesus, and an heir of your heavenly kingdom. We humbly implore you that as he has now become your child, you would watch over him, keep him in his baptismal grace. Watch him every day. Be with him. And Lord, may you draw him closer to you through word and sacrament and through the body of Christ here at St. James, that he may faithfully grow to lead a godly life in the praise and honor of your holy name. And finally, with all your saints, totally here because of the grace of God, Obtain the promise and inheritance in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. God's blessings. Round of applause for this guy. There you go. God's beat with you. There you go. And uh, as we always say, we, Jesus says, make a disciple, you baptize and teach. And here's a... Uh, a Bible, I'm sorry, it's not the kid's Bible with the uh, pictures. Okay, okay, good. And a uh, small catechism. And light that candle up every uh, December 3rd, remembering this day. God bless you and welcome, welcome to St. James. There you go. Thank you. Let us uh, continue on page uh, 6 with our prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank and we praise you for this day. But Lord, we pray for one that is coming. Send your Son, Jesus, that he comes again in glory. Heavenly Father, open our hearts, lift us up to see that day every day, to look forward to that day where there be no more death, no more sin, and no more Satan, Lord, and bless this Advent season that we focus our eyes on Jesus what he has done, and what he is going to do. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the word of God. Do we have a reader? Our first reading today is uh, from Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when the kind kindles, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him with who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you and your ways, behold you, behold you are angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time and shall, be, and shall we be saved. We've all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like, a, unrighteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Our next lesson is from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. 
so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the words of the word made flesh. Gospel according to St. Mark, the 11th chapter. When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of the Lord. You You may be seated. Having confessed our faith in the rite of holy baptism, I will invite any of our kids forward who want to come down front for the children's message. Come on down. All right, grab a seat up front. All righty. What's uh, what's different in our sanctuary today? What do you notice that's different as we look around the room? Yeah. There's flowers. Yep, we call those poinsettias. Yep. What What else, Aaron? It does say Emmanuel. That's a Christmassy word. What else do we have? Yeah. The candles, for sure. These are all part of what we call, yeah. Yeah. Something else different that you notice? Yeah, red banners. True, true. Yeah, lots of changes. Last one, Bodhi. Lots of flowers. True. This is all part of what we call the season of Advent, right? Advent is a season of preparation. It's where we get our hearts and our minds ready for the birth of who? Leon? True, we'll get there in a second, yeah. At Christmas, the birth of? Jesus. Jesus, right, the birth of Jesus. All of this is to get ready for the gift that is the birth of Jesus. When you guys get a normal present, whether it's your birthday or Christmas, do you have to do anything to prepare for that? Do you think? Kind of? Not really? Yeah? Okay. So maybe decorate if it's like a special occasion. But most of the time you don't really need to prepare to receive a gift, at least not in the same way that we do inside the church, right? Why do you think that is? I think it's the central idea that Jesus is such a great gift. It changes everything about the world around us, right? We have real peace because God is like us in the flesh. Jesus became like you and me, a human being, so we would have forgiveness. So we take this time to prepare so that way we have room in our hearts and in our minds to be thankful for the gift of Christ Jesus who was born on Christmas all those years ago. So Advent helps us to prepare, to get ready, 
for December 25th when Jesus, we celebrate the birth of Jesus uh, then on that day. Let's uh, fold our hands, bow our heads. You guys can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for forgiving and loving me. Help me to prepare for your birth at Christmas. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go grab a seat and we will continue with our next song. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Advent is a time of preparation, of getting things ready for the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've found that both in my own practice and also the historic practice of the church, Advent is a time for fasting, for prayer, for dedicating ourselves to the Word of God. And along with that, I would say introducing a new spiritual practice of some sort so that we can better prepare for the birth of our Savior and better grasp the reality of what it means that God became flesh incarnate and uh, saved us from our sins. So as a result of that, I was going through my daily reading and stumbled across this quote from St. Augustine on the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which is always kind of an odd reading at this time of the year. Nonetheless, here's what St. Augustine says. What great thing was it to the king of the ages to become the king of humanity? For Christ was not the king of Israel so that he might exact a tax or equip an army with weaponry and visibly vanquish an enemy. He was the king of Israel in that he rules minds, in that he gives counsel for eternity, in that he leads into the kingdom of heaven those who believe, hope, and love. It is a condescension, not an advancement, for one who is the Son of God equal to the Father, the word through whom all things were made to become king of Israel. It is an indication of pity, not an increase in power. So often that's the way we think of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Here comes the king, powerful, mighty, glorious. And yet St. Augustine says, this king arrives out of pity for his fallen creation ready to forgive sins and serve. I said before, this text is one we expect not at this time of the year, but instead during Lent. We expect this to be Palm Sunday's text, where we get ready for the crucifixion and for the resurrection that's at the center of Holy Week. And yet, this same gospel text underscores one of the great themes of Advent and Christmas. What is it? Well, last week we talked about the idea that Advent and Christmas is kind of a story about two kings. One king is King Herod, who has authority. He rules as the world would expect him to. He's in a palace. He has soldiers to enforce his will upon the population. A king in the traditional image. And yet the other king is King Jesus. He doesn't arrive as a man fully grown nor as an emperor, one that we would look at. Instead, he's born to us as a baby, an infant. He's born not in a palace, but rather in a stable with no room for his family in the inn. Indeed, he doesn't rule through force, but rather he rules through self-sacrificial love. Interestingly, he doesn't command soldiers. Instead, he has messengers evangelists, even the word angel means messenger. And so his messengers announce a victory that's won through peace instead of through violence. This is a very upside down king, and the kingdom of God is a very upside down place to be, it seems. St. Augustine was recognizing that fact. For Jesus, this is a lowering of himself in order to raise humanity up from their sin and brokenness. The word incarnate, the word spoken at the beginning of the foundation of the world, condescends to our level in order to speak words of peace and mercy, just like a parent gets down to their child's level to comfort and to care for them. So is God doing the very same thing by becoming incarnate, made of the same stuff as us. He does this so we would transcend sin and brokenness by becoming part of this heavenly spiritual kingdom inaugurated by Jesus upon the cross. And that's the surprising thing about Advent. At the center of Advent lies the cross of Calvary. That's at the end of our journey. And I think, given that Christmas starts ever earlier and earlier, sometimes the day after Thanksgiving, sometimes as early as Halloween, we get distracted by the plasticness of Christmas, right? The hallmarkiness. We think that the reason why we gather together for Christmas is to experience warm feelings and sentiment, to see the cozy baby all wrapped up in the, uh, in the manger. 
But historically, this was not the case for the church. In fact, historically, Advent had far more in common with that season of Lent. It was a penitential season where we prepared our hearts and minds. The church devoted itself to prayer, to fasting, to reading the Word of God, so we might better grasp the why of the incarnation, of the birth of Jesus. Why it was necessary for God to enter into our sin and brokenness, to enter into our suffering and darkness. Historically, sanctuaries actually Uh, kind of reflected that, right? In the sense that they were adorned with purple, pointing us forward to a suffering king who comes to make right the wrongs of the world around us. So that's the way we're going to enter into Advent this year. We're going to go into Advent, just as those people did, following Jesus on that triumphant entry day with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is an interesting prayer to begin our Advent season. You see, it's a royal prayer. It's a prayer that we would reserve for salvific events. Essentially, it means something to the effect of, save us now. That's what those people are crying out. So Mark is showing us in his gospel account that there's something about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem that's supposed to be connected with the chief act of salvation, which is the crucifixion. It's actually really interesting to me that the people who don't get that are the same ones crying out Hosanna in the highest. You see, the disciples didn't know any better. They didn't expect their Savior to have to suffer and die on their behalf. The crowd that again cries Hosanna here doesn't realize just how wrong their expectations are. Indeed, it would seem to me that the ultimate reason why this person wouldn't be the Savior would be because of his suffering and death. That's the one thing saviors aren't supposed to do. And yet that's at the very core of Jesus' ministry, the cross, Calvary. King Jesus will not immediately restore Jerusalem for those who are gathered in that parade all those years ago. Instead, he will bring about a heavenly kingdom crashing into the here and now by means of his cross and resurrection. His kingdom is very backwards indeed. His crown is not made of gold. His crown is made of thorns. His court, to the extent that there is one on Calvary, will be made of two criminals hung alongside him. His throne there is a cross, a very perplexing kingdom indeed. But St. Paul once said, I am resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. The incarnation, God becoming man, is all about that one thing, the journey to the cross. All of Jesus' journey, from birth to life to ministry to miracles to the end, is all about the cross. Because it's the cross that reconciles sinners and God. It fixes our relationship as God enters into the depth of our suffering in order to make things new, to make things right. So what catches us off guard each and every Advent is that the central theme of Christmas is how far God will go to save his people from their sins and once again create a lasting fellowship between God and man. And yet, what I think is so interesting about Advent is how quiet God's salvation often is. Advent is a time of silence, of diving deep into prayer in order to see the very subtle ways that God saves us from our sins. Isaiah seems to expect just the opposite. If you paid close attention to our Old Testament reading, he says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations would tremble at your presence. Isaiah is probably expecting what we're expecting when it comes to God's salvation and his acts. We want something great and glorious. We want something powerful. We want an Old Testament God who will rend the heavens, who will boil oceans. We want somebody that will make God's name known and show that the church shouldn't be getting pushed around the way that it has. I think we can all relate to that feeling at some point in our lives. 
I think the biggest problem for the church in America is that we desire a strong man. We want someone that'll push back. We want someone that'll show the church is a serious place to be and a powerful place to be, that the church really is triumphant and that we should be taken seriously. But in Advent, we see just the opposite. We don't have a God like that, do we? We don't have a God who's a strong man. We have a God who is a humble servant. We have a God who rules through self-sacrificial love. We have a God who encourages us not to rule, but rather to care for the least of these, the widowed and the orphan, the sick and the elderly. Our God does rend the heavens, but it doesn't happen in a way that we expect. Instead, it is by means of his own sacrificial death upon the cross where heaven is opened. The temple curtain is torn in two, and God's presence is freely accept- accessible. It's this cross which causes every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus is Lord. The reality of the church is that Jesus isn't the strong man that we expect. He's an infant king, lowly born, placed in a manger, who nonetheless rules our hearts and minds even now, even from a manger. We often look for light during this Advent season in all the wrong places and in all sorts of different locations. But yet we can still take the season of Advent in the midst of our dark, cold world, both literally and metaphorically, to return to the manger. One of my favorite hymns we sung today, Savior of the Nations Come, features this verse. From the manger, newborn light shines in glory through the night. Darkness there no more resides. In this light, faith now abides. In this light, this is the light we receive. The Christ child born to us in this humble way. And it is him who is at the center of our season as we prepare for that wonderful, miraculous, unexpected birth. But when we think about preparation, especially at this time of the year, I think we can easily, easily get off track. Probably some of you are preparing in your homes for Christmas this season. And I like to ask the question of what are we expecting from this particular holiday? Are we looking for that Hallmark-esque, picture-perfect Christmas? Everything prepared just the right way, the food as it should be, the right people at the dinner table? Or are we looking for something a little bit different? And I think we should be looking for something a little bit different. Every year in our, my family, a tradition is we watch uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. My middle school students know this. Uh, and I think it's theologically profound in many different ways. But in the special, we wrestle with the same problems that our titular character Charlie Brown does. He's in the midst of a commercialized holiday, a very plastic Christmas if ever there was one. He's struggling with seasonal depression, all the usual problems that people have at this time of the year. And where does that struggle lead him? To his would-be psychiatrist, but more often torturer, Lucy, who suggests that he should go help with the Christmas pageant. Maybe he'll find there a sense of belonging, of meaning at at the center of the Christmas season. And yet it's from there where the real problem starts to emerge. There is no Christ at the center of that play. Instead, there is the ever-expanding commercialization, the plasticness that he's wrestling with. And Charlie's, Charlie Brown's lack of enthusiasm is exasperated by the people in his life. Snoopy, who's usually our uh, go-to for what it means to uh, have joy in the midst of the season, has submitted his house for a Christmas decorating contest. And uh, the contest says that you can find the true meaning of Christmas here by winning a cash prize and having the best decorations. His little sister, too, I'm always amused by, says that Santa Claus should bring her tens and twenties instead of toys. If only Charlie Brown could experience Advent as the church experiences Advent. We strip back the excess. We say goodbye to the alleluias and the glory. We get rid of the glitz and the the, uh, glamour. We abandon the commercialism of Christmas to focus on repentance. Repentance because the kingdom of God has drawn near to you in the Christ child. We return to this one central reality 
that Christ Jesus was born in that manger so that he would grow up to live, to die, to rise, reconciling God and man, crafting the church, a place where true peace and joy can be known in a lasting way, in a way that extends far beyond this season. Your king comes to you as a baby, redeeming you through every act that we will see in Advent and Christmas and beyond. But your king enters into this world in a simple, humble way. We often look to the wrong places, just like all those characters in Charlie Brown, for satisfaction at this time of year. Jesus, in turn, invites you into the heavenly kingdom. Jesus invites you right here into the gathering of believers, week in and week out. Our king comes to us, not as a mighty ruler or as the strong man, but instead through simple means like his word and promises. He feeds you through simple things like bread and wine, which through the lens of faith become great things, a life-giving feast of his very body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And yes, your king is returning to you even now into our hearts and minds. We often want to know how we can keep Christ in the Christmas season all throughout this time of the church year, and we're struck by this simple thing. Return, repent. The birth of Christ Jesus, God in the flesh, is for you, and it is even now freely given. Our lowly born king is not what we expect, but he is in fact what we need. He's not like Herod, that terrible strong man. Instead, he's our prince of peace. He sends evangelists to proclaim that very word of peace into your hearts and minds so that you would be forgiven and made new. May we respond then with shouts of Hosanna, but shouts of Hosanna rightly oriented as we seek to serve as our servant king first served us. And that's what Advent then is really all about. One simple fact, that our king has come to be crucified. His death has become the gateway to life for all who believe in him. His resurrection has given you new life, a present hope in the midst of any trouble. And centrally, we see who our God is in that that divine word took on flesh, becomes like us, so that we might once again be like God, forgiven, holy, and righteous, a precious possession for whom Christ died for, for whom he rose for, and for whom we now live for. Amen. And now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Dr. Pim, with our best supporting his ministry among us and throughout this city through our work. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Through Yes, when this flesh and heart shall
shall fail and mortal life shall cease amazing grace shall then prevail in heaven's joy and peace and dad Good guitar. Let us rise and praise our Lord, worship Him with our prayers, and pray for this city, pray for one another, and pray for His ministry among us. Almighty God, bless us this Advent season. Help us to engage our situation. Be honest with ourselves and our need. What is it that that we are waiting for? Who has come? Who is this Jesus? Why do we need him so much? And may this season bring that out in us, to see our sins and see our desperation, but especially to see what we have in Christ, forgiveness, eternal life, that it's going to be okay. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we pray for those that need peace now in Christ, who are suffering, who are hurting, who are hungry, who are poor, who are underemployed. We lift up to you those who are sick in hospital or living with chronic illness. We lift up to you those with broken relationships, those who are mentally ill as well as physically ill. We pray for healing for them. We pause and we lift up to you our desperate prayers to you for those in our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, we pray for peace throughout the world. We pray for peace between nations. We pray for leaders to lead in that. We pray for peace in our lives, in our community, in this city. And Lord, help us to be workers of peace through compassion and kindness, forgiveness, We pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray for peace in Israel. We lift up to you those who who lead our president, Congress, our governor and mayor, police officers and firefighters, first responders. And Lord, raise up among us new leaders who lead our communities with truth, righteousness, Justice, Lord, in your mercy. And finally, we pray for the ministries of St. James. May we do what we do well, word and sacrament, teaching here, gathering here primarily, but also in our school as our ministers, our teachers teach there the good news of Christ and give students a uh, worldview and teach subjects centered in Jesus and hope. We pray that you expand these things in the next year, couple years, that we grow in our numbers here, the community of Christ, that we grow in our ministries and the people that we can affect through our overall plan, let alone building. Lord, in your mercy. All these things we pray confident you hear and you answer us in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed good and right and salutary that we should give thanks to God for all things all the time. But today we, we thank and praise you for sending Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared, proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and calling sinners to repentance that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Oh, be. Jesus Christ, and the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Take and eat to the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the true blood of Christ shed for you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you. Take and eat the true body of Jesus for you. Take and eat the true body of Christ for you. Take and eat the body of Jesus Christ for you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you. Take and eat the body of Jesus for you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you. Take and eat the true body of Jesus Christ for you. Take you take communion? Take and eat the body of Christ for you. Take and eat the true body of Jesus for you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you, Lord, bless and keep you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you, Lord, bless and keep you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you, Shannon, may the Lord continue to lead you. Take and eat the body of Christ for you. Take the true body of Jesus for you. Take the true body of Christ for you. Take the body of Christ for you. Take the body of Jesus Christ for you. Take the body of Christ for you. Take the body of Jesus Christ. Take the true body of Christ. Body of Christ for you, Michael. the body of Christ for you, Lord. Taking the body of Jesus Christ for you, Clay. Taking the true body of Christ for you. Taking the body of Christ for you, Ian. Taking the true body of Jesus for you, Lord. Lord, bless and keep you, bless and keep you. Taking the body of 
body of Christ for you. Take me the body of Christ for you. Take me the body of Christ for you.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this holy meal, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that confirms your covenant with us, our forgiveness, our resurrection. May it not only bless our faith, but our lives, transforming us into Christ in our words, in our deeds, in our community drawing others to this hope, this peace in Christ. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. A couple of announcements. I know we're getting a little long there here, but a uh, couple things. Thank you for all of you engaged in this last campaign of Building on Christ. We have reached 2.4, I think, with some conversations of last week. We will be hitting near 2.5 of commitments on your end to making sure we ex- enrich and expand not just the buildings, but the ministries of St. James and get out there in this city uh, and just increase that reach of bringing hope. You've been a part of that. I want to invite those that have not yet participated to know this. Even greater than the money given, which is amazing, the generosity and the commitment out there, is just people saying yes to something. So if you've not said yes to this, I encourage you to think about doing that. If you haven't done it because you thought, I don't really have a lot to give, what are they going to do with mine? That's okay. Saying yes to this, throwing in a commitment, even whatever it amount that is between you and God, is a powerful act. And I encourage you to do that this last week as we end this campaign, uh, not just for good, we actually begin it as we go forward in building in staff and in uh, our physical building to reach more people. Uh, So think about that right now. I'd love to see that go up to 200 people of our community um, uh, engaged in that. So pray about that. Think about that. We have a voters meeting in a couple of weeks, December 17, uh, after the second service. It will be making a decision on how much to borrow, what exactly are we going to do. It's basically going to follow exactly what we laid out in our campaign, but we'll have more details for you and a financial plan to accomplish that as we now know what we're dealing with on our our end, what we can give toward that. Pray about that now. This is your church. This is your congregation. Your participation makes this powerful. So I really encourage you to pray about it now. Think about it now. Ask questions out and be there uh, uh, December 17th. On that note, next Sunday, we've got caroling. Come and check it out next Sunday after second service. Wednesday services, we have a beautiful service with uh, harp as we sing Christmas songs and focus on the angels of peace 
And that's a 7 o'clock meal beforehand. Check out our Advent devotions. Get engaged on that. Be in the Word. Be in prayer. Fast and pray. May this Advent season be a powerful time of realizing what you have in Christ, the peace that we have especially, and what is coming. And may God share that through us as well. Uh, Angel Tree, too. Figure that out. We've got, uh, this is the last day. Grab a uh, ticket. Look at it on your, on your, uh, in your uh, folder there. We want to fill out our Angel Tree. We have a bunch of commitments to give uh, to that. So take a look at that. And youth later on today, right? All right. Uh, also, you need to know this. We have a an Al-Anon meeting that meets here once a uh, week as well. We host that downstairs on a Sunday. That's part of your ministry of making sure people in need are served. So that's an awesome thing. Really excited about, about that. Please keep those in your prayers. Oh, and, sorry, see, this is the only reason why these are long is everyone has something they want me to say. Anyhow, uh, our Christmas cantata is going to rock Greater than the voters' meeting, the day before. What a great way to get ready. That's Saturday. Come and hang out. Listen to amazing orchestration and choir and get in that Christmas spirit December 16th. Thanks for all those that came to Christmas Fest. And, Kodra, thank you for last Thursday's Romanian Madrigal Choir. Absolutely blew me away. What a blessing of people getting together and serving the Romanian community in this area. Let's sing our last song. Refreshments downstairs, come on up here and uh, say hello to David there and congratulate him. Go in peace, serve the Lord. All right, congratulations, big guy.